Um, okay, so let's begin. It's hard to deny that humanity has undergone some real tangible progress. We've moved from uh, authoritarian systems of government to democracies. We've moved from uh, widespread criminality and unruliness to law and order. We've also moved from magic and superstition to science and a natural understanding of the world. And finally, we moved from stick stones and smoke screens, uh, smoke signals, to uh, hadron colliders and the world wide web. But it's clear, it clearly hasn't all been good. So we also have some problems. We've had some setbacks. So large perturbations facilitated the spread of contagions like the plague, uh, decimated environmental conditions. We've been able to wage war at a global and industrialized scale uh, with cataclysmic effect. And famines, subjugation, and torture still blind uh, many parts of the world. Indeed, now more than ever, we seem to have the dubious honor of possessing the ability of, uh, of regress, in fact, regress to the point of extinction. So there are the usual existential risks. These involve things like bacteria and viruses. There are also ex existential risks like supervolcanoes and meteorite strikes. But there are also those existential risks that are mandate, those that we've added uh, in, recent, uh, in our recent history, and these involve nuclear, chemical, biological weapons, they involve man-made climate change, and they involve uh, the prospects, the dangers of machines taking over uh, either on their behalf or on the behalf of some uh, human beings, some human beings. Okay, so, perhaps the greatest cautionary tale ever to be told is the failure of the SETI programs to detect alien life. So the SETI program is, uh, stands for uh, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. There are a bunch of these programs that, that have been running for many decades, but in, in particular for the last three decades, the search has been quite intense. But we still haven't found any alien signals out there. According to the latest, most unchargeable uh, estimates of the Drake equation, that's the Drake equation over there, of uh, the number of civilizations that are capable of emitting or broadcasting uh, signals that we can detect, there should be a few thousand such civilizations just in our galaxy, in the Milky Way. But we haven't been able to detect them in this year. One of the terms uh, in the equation that in fact we be underestimated right now, this term here, is the fraction of the uh, star systems that contain planets. Right? We now know there are many more star systems than planets out there, in which case the chance of actually detecting such signals should be even higher, and yet we haven't detected it. But there is one term in this equation that we might be severely, significantly uh, overestimating, and that is the last term here. That's the length of time that the civilization capable of emitting such signals does, in fact, emit such signals into space. Now, this length might be, on average, very, very short. Uh, why would that be the case? Well, you can imagine, given what I've been telling you already, it might just be that these guys have self-destructed. It might just be that most civilizations out there that exist in the universe uh, don't last very long because they create the technologies that are ultimately uh, basically in their end. So they die from their own hands. So how are we to avoid such a bleak future? Well, we need to devise a practicable plan uh, that's going to help us uh, do so. But to do that, first of all, we need to identify what would be the likeliest 
source of trouble. What could cause the most trouble? Now, even though in recent years in the media, uh, machines taking over have been publicized the hardest, uh, it's actually, we're still quite far away from such a thing ever happening if it ever does happen. Uh, and it's still the case at this point that humans are basically the most likely source of trouble. Uh, we are uh, the most likely source for being our author, authors of our own destruction. Okay, so uh, which humans in particular? Well, uh, quite clearly, it's those humans who are in power, those who, humans who hold elected office. These humans are uniquely positioned to start or stop something as momentous as an extinction level event, uh, an event that's going to wipe out our species. So let's look at what we may be able to do to prevent this from happening. So this is really what this talk is about. Now, there are roughly three levels at which we can affect changes, at which we can introduce changes. And I'm going to make three proposals, one at each of these levels. These are the levels of the elected officials, the level of the political parties, and the level of the voters. So this concerns the entire political process. Before I proceed, though, uh, and before I give you these proposed changes, I'd like to point out that, of course, I'm not implying that there are no safe safeguards out there already in the political process. There are some safeguards, but the whole point of this talk is, I guess, to present additional safeguards that are going to reduce the chance of it, that there's something going terribly wrong even further. Okay, so we begin with electing it. And in particular, with positions of leadership. Now, it's quite clear that there are good and bad leaders out there, now and in history. And it's quite clear that there are leaders who are rational and cautious, and there are leaders who are foolish and reckless. There are those who care about improving the lives of their people, and even, even the people who live beyond the borders of the countries they live in, and those who couldn't care less. So, what, if anything, can we do then to make sure that the kind of leaders we end up with are the sort of leaders that are not going to increase our chance of becoming extinct, but the sort of leaders that are going to, in fact, increase such a uh, possibility, such a uh, Okay, what can we do? Let's run some diagnostics. Let's think about it. Why do I'm caring and scrupulous and foolhardy people seek positions of leadership? Why do such people seek positions of leadership? Well, the answer should be fairly clear. Just one major motivation is the power and the wealth that comes with these positions. Right? Okay. For those who put themselves above all else, in fact, the temptation is just too sweet to ignore. There is just too much for them to gain, um, and therefore they. Uh, they seek out such positions. So that's the first thing to my proposal. We can make such positions less attractive to those who are power hungry and those who merely seek uh, to benefit themselves. How can we do that? Here are two ideas. These are just proposals, right? Things to think about, things to consider. First idea is we can make the chance of elected office uh, much less shiny. How? By basically diffusing the authority and control that's uh, in each and every uh, political position of leadership. Right? Each and every leadership position. So in other words, we uh, spread out more of the power to different positions instead of having it concentrated in one place. That makes the position much less attractive for people who are power. Um, we can also make the financial, that's the second idea, we can also make the financial rewards uh, much less juicy uh, by imposing strict and indeed stricter conditions than the conditions currently uh, in place. So for example, to expand on the second point, we can require by law that anyone who wants to take office should give up all their wealth before entering office. They could give it up to all the charities or they could give it to the state or the state can distribute Charities. Moreover, we, we can require by law 
that after they leave the elected post, they are not, uh, they should not be allowed to uh, be to earn any uh, compensation, any money uh, from any private uh, work. They should not be allowed to invest. They should not be allowed to accept substantial gifts. In fact, what they should do is have uh, an advisory role in subsequent governments, and they should, have, they should have a salary that comes with that advisory role, which is decent but not extravagant, that allows them to live out the rest of their lives until retirement. In short, elected officials should truly be public servants, not just in name, but in practice and for life. Next up is the uh, political party. There are once again good and bad uh, parties. There are good and bad phases in political, uh, in political parties' history. There are good and bad policies being put forward by party members. And there are good and bad choices and leaders uh, that these parties make. So again, we ask the question, what if anything can we do to ensure that the role political parties play decreases the likelihood of humanity's self-destruction? Again, let's run some diagnostics. What is it that parties do? Well, political parties, as they can, as they're currently organized and run, uh, are there to serve not just the people, but also to maintain and indeed increase their mass and also their prosperity. So there's something quite wrong happening there already. The choice of leaders and policies in, is made with one eye on general idea of ideology, the ideology of the party, whether that be infused with political, social, uh, religious ideas, and with another eye on winning elections. The end result is, needless to say, uh, a contrived, highly, a fairly contrived set of choices and highly unlikely to be optimal in serving the common good, in serving the people. Once again, the temptation to put the good of the party uh, above the good of the people, uh, and hence to create unnecessary risk to ignore. So that's the clue to the second proposal I have for you. Up here, we need parties whose prime good is the preservation of humanity. One thought along these lines is to create global cross-border uh, parties with precisely that uh, prime good in place. That, that, aim, uh, that aim as a prime aim of those parties, right? To preserve humanity. That's the number one aim of such a party. Since that may currently be a tall order, let's consider a more modest and more attainable goal. So consider, instead, a transnational alliance between local groups, uh, hence not really a party, uh, with a simple agenda. What's that agenda? It's a very, very simple agenda. Basically, you vote down any candidates who are uh, likely to put the future of humanity uh, at risk under threat. Members of the Alliance would be otherwise free to make any choices they like. The only constraint would be in emergency cases. This would not happen all the time, it would not happen rarely, and then they wouldn't tell you who to vote for. Um, uh, I mean, you, you would be, of course, if you were part of this Alliance, you would also have a say in these things. Uh, as to how this needs to get determined, but you would only just identify some leaders who may be willing to put it all, uh, to, to risk it all for, uh, for basically nothing, risk global war for nothing. It's crucial to stress, stress that such alliance would probably lose its potency if it tried to expand its agenda, as divisions would be more likely to arise. In other words, the agenda has to remain safe. It would be as simple as that. So how do one plant the seeds of such an alliance? Well, there are very good places to start, and they include uh, basically getting um, uh, help from uh, scientists and academics and artists and university students, people who actually do truly care about the future of this planet and about uh, our preservation. So finally, let's consider uh, the level of voters themselves. There are good and bad voters. 
But you know, the bad ones, some of them are pathetic. They don't go at all. Others are passionate but blindly follow the party line, yet others are downright prejudiced, making no effort at internal dialogue whatsoever, uh, not even external dialogue, not even not internal dialogue. Such behavior surely must be avoided as it affects the results of elections in ways that one day, maybe in most elections, it doesn't really matter to have such people, but one day, it may prove cataclysmic, this kind of behavior. So, that's the clue to my last proposal. We need dispassionate, rational, and better informed voters. In a word, we need voters who handle voting choices with some degree of expertise. We need our voters to be something like mini experts. Think about this for a minute. When you go to a doctor, do you expect to be treated by someone who merely has an opinion on which diseases cause which uh, symptoms, on which uh, diseases can be cured at all or not? On what, which drugs are effective and how effective they are? No, you're expecting somebody who's an expert in this field, who knows uh, and is up to date with all the information about the latest clinical trials, all the evidence, all the available evidence, and all the methods, all the treatments. The same holds for a bunch of other professions, whether that be a policeman, uh, a pilot, uh, whether that be a firefighter. Uh, in all such uh, cases, many such professions, when uh, the life of somebody is at stake, is at risk, and the professional has a duty to uh, know enough about what they're doing in order to save people's lives, uh, it's extremely important uh, to have this information, to, to be so informed. Right? Why should this be any different with voters? Why should it be merely a right we have without any uh, uh, associated responsibility? Why shouldn't we be informed uh, speak about voters? So why is choosing a leader, a party, or a policy any different if a leader, a party, or a policy regularly makes decisions that have an effect on human life and may one day make a decision that ends life altogether? Okay. So before I bring this talk to a close, it's worth considering an objection very quickly. In reply to these proposals, someone may simply say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right? The system has been working, at least democracy, the last few years. Years, uh, it, it's been working more or less well. Why let it? I think that's sage advice in the case of things that are broken and can be fixed. But the kind of scenario we're envisaging is a scenario where if it breaks, it stays broken. If it breaks, it cannot be fixed. If we get extinct, there's no way back to fix it, to fix the problem. Right? So the only advice one must give is that some changes need making before it's too late. So we need to fix things before it's too late. So, to summarize, there are clear existential risks that must not be ignored. The best way to tackle these threats is to add safeguards to the political process. And uh, they don't have to be the safeguards I'm proposing here. I just want you to at least think of what can be done to uh, improve our risks improve our ability to deal with these risks. To be precise, I propose changes at all three levels of this political process. I then argued in reply to the if we then wrote or fix it argument that some changes need making before it's too late. Or to put it another way, unless we act now, there may not be another day uh, to act. Thank you.